Welcome everyone. We will begin in approximately four minutes. So if you need to go and grab a drink or go and grab a snack, we have an exciting lineup this afternoon to talk about a topic that is important to all of us. We will be back and live at four to begin. Approximately four minutes. So if you need to go and grab a drink or go and Good afternoon again. We have three minutes until we begin. We are going to start our eSchool Plus initiative webinar series on equity in K-12 school reopenings in just three minutes. I am your moderator for the afternoon, Annette Anderson, and I welcome all of you to today's discussion. Thank you for joining us. We will start in three minutes. Okay, it is now 3.58. We have two minutes until we just begin our discussion. Our first in the webinar series, Equity in K-12 School Reopening, sponsored by the eSchools Plus Initiative. Today's conversation is on lost learning during COVID-19. So go and grab your snack, your drink, settle in for what we know is gonna be a great conversation with our panel of experts. Just under two minutes, we will begin. In less than one minute, we will begin. So if you haven't yet had a chance to grab your snack or your beverage and settle in, now's the time to do so. We will begin in just under one minute to start our first in the eSchool Plus Initiative webinar series. And we thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Annette Anderson, and I am the Deputy Director for the Center for Safe and Healthy Schools and a member of the eSchool Plus Initiative. I am also your moderator this afternoon for today's discussion. I would like to welcome you to this first in our eSchool Plus Initiative webinar series on equity in K-12 school reopenings. Today's topic is lost learning during COVID-19, understanding which students lost the most. We're here to discuss a topic that is near and dear to the heart of many of us who are interested in the issues of equity in education. And we are really excited to have some very esteemed guests and colleagues with us today to have this conversation. So uh, first, before we begin, I want to say a special thank you to our seminar sponsors for today's conversation, including the Johns Hopkins University School of Education, the Hopkins Consortium for School-Based Health Solutions, the Berman Institute of Bioethics, and the Rails Center for the Integration of Health and Education. Next, 
I would like to introduce our three panelists for this afternoon. We've got really wonderful, highly esteemed colleagues with a great deal of expertise in our conversation today. And I am so looking forward to their participation. First, we have Mr. Peter Connum, who is the principal of the Elmer A. Henderson at Johns Hopkins University Partnership School, also known as Henderson Hopkins, also known as HH. Uh, and we're excited to have Peter here with us today. We also have Dr. Yolanda Abel. Dr. Abel is the Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Advanced Studies in the School of Education at Johns Hopkins. And then finally today, we have with us Dr. Bob Balfance, who is the Director of the Everyone Graduate Center. And he is also a Research Professor at the Center for, Social, for the Social Organization of Schools in the School of Education at Johns Hopkins. And I would like to say welcome to all three of you. Thank you for joining us today. Now, just before we begin, I wanted to just go over the format for today's conversation for all of our guests so that everyone will know what to expect. Each of our panelists will be presenting a slide deck where they will be talking about some of these issues um, during their presentations. Following the three presentations, we will have a discussion question, uh, some discussion questions. And uh, at that time, our, we will open up the floor following our discussion questions to our audience. This is where we want to engage with you, those of you who have joined us. So please feel free to add your questions into the chat because we will be checking the chat so that we can ask your questions to our esteemed panelists. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Peter Connum, the principal of Henderson Hopkins so that he can begin. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Anderson, um, and uh, for that kind introduction. And I'm really glad to be here talking with fellow colleagues uh, around these really important issues around how like equity in the time of COVID. Mm -hmm. And so um, my name is Peter Canham. I'm again, the principal of Henderson Hopkins at Johns Hopkins Partnership School to K-8 situated in East Baltimore with nearly 600 students, 98% uh, African-American and proudly one of the most improved schools in Baltimore City over the past two years. So we're on a great trajectory. And um, if we could go to the next so slide, um, when the pandemic hit, um, we had to adjust immediately, just like many people. And we had three prongs to our approach. Um, number one is how do we keep our students engaged academically with high quality instruction? Um, keeping the bar high, how can we do that? Two is we are situated in a food desert in East Baltimore. There is not a, a grocery store within walking distance of our students and we provide a thousand meals a day. So it's immediate food insecurity is a real issue in our community and immediately we give a thousand meals out a day breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and a snack. And that immediately became a concern of ours. Um, and then how do we keep our families healthy and safe? Uh, we know, particularly in the African-American community, how COVID has hit and struck, and we wanted to be prepared uh, for that. Um, and so next slide, please. So we thought about it in, in, in two buckets. Number one is we needed to get in contact with each one of our families. We needed to, we needed to connect with them. Um, and, and then we need to support our teachers to deliver. And as I'm going through this, I'll highlight some of the challenges that we've had, you know, with in, in, in equity issues. Um, so number one is we, we outreached aggressively to families to make sure we got in contact with them. We retooled our budget with the support of Johns Hopkins and made a commitment to give every child a, a laptop immediately. So a device is an issue with access. Uh, we made the decision that we gave out all of our um, laptops, retooled money to get another set of laptops for our families. Um, um, really knowing that our parents need to understand where we were, we designed a tech system so we could text our families to kind of let them understand what assignments their students are completing and what's they're not. Um, did robocalls, parent received emails, parent town halls that we designed in, in, in conjunction with the school-based consortium um, around items like for families, how to do remote learning, how to stay safe in this time of COVID, 
And so we really worked with our um, parents and community outreach. And then um, we really fanned out. Um, uh, this 100% of students contacted with 98% of students engaged, close to 99% makes me really proud of the work. But it was, a, it, it was a big effort to make sure we knew where every student was. Um, and we're gonna talk about the learning in a minute. But then it's also another huge shift is the teachers. Um, how do we support our teachers to deliver exemplary learning when they're not in front of them? And so we were able to really commit to going online, training our teachers and supporting them on our uh, Google site, Google Classroom, and um, um, set, helping them and supporting them set up the classrooms, feeling comfortable going remote. Um, learning how to deal with a chat and having a bunch of third graders wanting to chat at the same time. But it's, it really was a level of comfort and that's another access issue, the technology, the infrastructure to be able to train and support teachers to deliver the instruction remotely. Um, uh, next, next slide, uh, please. And so this is a slide that I just wanted to show you. Um, uh, and I think the most interesting thing was, um, we, we were able to average around 84% attendance of engagements with our students on their online platforms, which I'm really proud of. Um, but at the same time, the, what really keeps us up, if you look at the different colors of the bars, um, you know, the green bar is the students who are getting on every day, every session, got the parents set up, got everybody set up. But then the, the other bars are um, the families that had two or less engagements. And so those are the students that we were really most concerned about. Why aren't they logging on? Is it a, is it a, is it a technical issue or is there something going on in the home? Or, um, uh, uh, or and what, are, what are ways that we can support our families? And so led by um, our uh, Mr. Velleman and our, and our, and our, and our, um, um, our team at, um, our, our social work team, our guidance counselor, we fanned out with our leadership team and contacted every student. Um, but it's concerning about how many students, even with that extensive outreach that we weren't engaging on a daily basis. Um, so next slide, uh, please. Um, and I think the question before I go into this slide, just really quickly, and the question is why? why? Why weren't students engaging? And I think it's really important to kind of unpack some of these things, and I will real quickly, um, is number one is um, we have many of our families that are frontline workers. They're in hospital, they're working at the hospital, they're working at the medical center, and they're working at the MTA. I have one example of a student, uh, two students, Peyton and... Um, uh, Peyton and Paige, a second and fourth grader, and they weren't logging on. So we reached out to them. They were on my caseload. And I talked to dad and said, why, you know, we need to get them logged on. Do you have access? Do you have internet? And he says, we have it all, but I'm driving a bus all day and my wife's at the hospital and the fourth grader is monitoring the second grader and getting, get, get, getting online and they had different schedules. And I'm gonna be honest, it's a lot. It's a lot for a parent to do with this shift, let alone, um, um, a fourth grader overseeing a second grader. So we have issues of that, like that is another equity issue, like a safe space to learn the uh, proper adult supervision that we can't just assume um, when we think about um, providing um, remote learning. Um, I wanna touch on this before I turn it over is we, we, we retooled really quickly, which I think is really important in many of our communities to think about food distribution. We've become a hub for East Baltimore. We partnered with all those organizations, Hopkins, Maryland Food Bank, City Schools, World Central Kitchen. We call ourselves the triple threat, which is uh, we deliver food to our families' homes. We, we, you can drive through, you can pick up and you can get fresh fruits and vegetables, you can get perishables and non-perishables. And um, it's really, in, in the light, it's really been a great effort and a community effort. There's been a community desire and need um, um, that, that, we, that, that, that is really unmet. And um, I just couldn't stress enough that food insecurity is a really big deal. And we've really got to think about how we can push out more food. Um, and even if we set up food hubs, it's really important to get it in the hands of our um, residents. Then there's a huge demand. And then lastly, um, um, we, keeping our families safe is so huge in this day and age. We partnered with the school-based consortium um, at Johns Hopkins. Um, Alice, if you could do the next slide, please. 
Um, and we've launched Parent Town Halls Health Hotline that our parents can call if they have any questions about COVID and do a response. We set up a website for not only educators, parents, and grandparents of how they can stay safe and well. How do they deal with stress? How are they dealing with uh, a trauma? How are they dealing with, how can they deal with um, loss? We are thinking about that, partner with organizations, but, and, 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 and working through those things and providing resources. But it's really, really important as we think about moving forward, how we're gonna meet the needs of our students, not only academically, but social emotionally. Um, and so that's my opening and I'm looking forward to the questions um, when they come. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for your leadership and your vision in this work, Peter. Really appreciate that. Dr. Abel, we would like to now turn it over to you for your presentation. Greetings. I'm Yolanda Abel. I'm very glad to be here with you this afternoon. And I am looking forward to the continued conversation that we're having. I think what we just heard was the perfect example of what this can look like in practice. So if we step back and do a little bit of blend of the practical and the research, I wanted to connect our conversation to summer slide and COVID-19 slide. So summer learning has been a key area of interest, both by practitioners, um, teachers, administrators, parents, as well as researchers for the last several years. That in general, it is thought when children don't have academic enrichment because they're out of school during the summer, they lose some of the learning that they acquired during that academic or school year. Um, summer slide is looked at as a loss of two to three months of learning and um, excuse me, summer um, slowdown is looked at maybe one to two weeks of learning loss or kind of staying stagnant, meaning that you don't necessarily acquire or develop your learning and academic skills over the summer. So in so much that that already exists and is a phenomenon of concern for culturally and linguistically diverse students who might also come from low income backgrounds, kind of so what does COVID add to this mix in terms of school stop face-to-face -face learning earlier than originally planned? Peter just shared a great example of kind of how they work diligently. He had almost a 99% um, engagement rate with his student body. All schools can't say that. So kind of what happened to those students who for whatever reason were not making those connections, were not having that engagement, who might have never actually signed on as part of that learning process? How do we bring them back? And in so much that COVID-19 in and of itself has been a traumatic experience across the board for us, both adults and children, there are also other things going on in the world in regards to some of the protests and things that have happened. Um, depending on the ethnic background of a child, the Supreme Court's decision around DACA. So there's just lots of stresses going on in the world. So kind of the degree of social support is where I want it to land. And in particular, I wanted to bring us back to Joyce Epstein and her six types of parent engagement, parenting, learning at home, communicating, volunteering, collaborating with the community and advocacy. And I like her frame because it is broad enough to encompass almost all those aspects that we have looked at in terms of how you make a difference and support learners. So in so much that what we are looking at is that very practical side that Peter just talked to us about. As he said, there were still challenges. He gave an example of siblings who had some challenges around logging on, not because they didn't have the access or the internet, but because of um, primary care of an older sibling to a younger sibling and kind of just how do you negotiate and balance that. So while this was a very unexpected turn of events in terms of how fast schools had to pivot to make this shift and to continue to support students and their families, how might we utilize some of our existing volunteers? If you already had people in your building who might have been um, your senior supports, your literary supports, 
lit literacy tutor type supports, how might they um, get involved in this process and be someone who could connect on with that student and do an additional kind of check-in and support around the learning process so that we could say with more confidence that all our students really had an opportunity to be as invested as possible in this online learning aspect. Um, again, the adults, some of them have children themselves, balancing the demands of the teaching they needed to do for their students, and then being there as a parent for their own children as they engaged in their online learning. What are the ways that we, from a business and governmental standpoint, might have been more lenient and flexible with those kinds of understandings? in terms of kind of having this mass either go work at home because you have the type of job that will allow that or you're still an essential worker and you need to go out how are we kind of minimizing those disruptions in ways that can move forward at this juncture most school districts as well as university settings such as hopkins are making decisions about how we return to school in the fall so we are still kind of grappling with these issues and what will be different. So how are we taking a moment to step back and reflect and look at our lessons learned? What is it that we can continue to do? What is it that we can modify or do differently to kind of add and maybe address some of those points that we missed previously. So I think in the context of this conversation and how we're thinking about that family and community engagement, it is really important that we are doing those types of things like Peter exemplified in his talk about the parent town halls. How are we getting them engaged and invested in understanding the process? Looking at it from a potential research point of view as we move forward in this work, how might we look at a group of parents that we might do some training and deploy in terms of how if they have the bandwidth and the time they might be kind of some of these learning ambassadors that we might need for some of this additional check-in or being online with people in terms of this process there's also been a lot of the unknown in regards to businesses and some businesses not reopening as we come back out of this, I do live in Baltimore City. So thinking about restaurants and other types of places, some of whom have closed down. While it is not the job of the school per se, schools are often hubs for information and connections. So how are we helping our parents retool skills, um, look at resumes, those types of things that might help secure employment if they have been a part of the contingent in this process who might have lost employment as a result of some of these COVID closures and other things that are happening. So I guess I really just want to remind us that this is complex. And while COVID in and of itself is definitely a challenge and something to be reckoned with, for lots of our students, this is an additional layer of trauma. It's not the only layer of trauma. So how are we making those decisions about how we are offering the mental health supports that children in our families often need to process the events that are going on around the world in general, and some that might be quite local and within the family structure. And last but not least, the always encouragement of how do you find the learning in the everyday activities that you do in terms of if you're cooking dinner and you talk about the measurements for having a recipe, doubling, whatever it might be. If you're not actually cooking and just need to serve up a ready-made meal, how do you do that in such a way? What are the types of questions that you ask to extend a child's learning so that almost everything has a learning element in it, not in the sense that life is not fun, but in the sense that things happen. What are the conversations we are having that no matter what else is going on, we might minimize the academic loss normally associated with summer slide and now being associated with the COVID-19 slide. Thank you and I look forward to having conversation. Thank you, Dr. Abel, for your insightful comments. And then Dr. Balfans, Bob, can you share a little bit about uh, thinking through our vulnerable students also possibly at risk of dropping out? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Annette, and I'm, I'm glad to be here today. I'm going to build off what uh, Peter and Yolanda said and focus a little bit on how we got our response right to learning loss and, and sort of kids being disengaged from school and at risk of dropping out. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, to start with that, I think it's important to think that there's at least two fundamental truths we're going to face as students come back in the fall. 
Um, the first is that COVID-19 has reinforced existing structural inequities. Um, and one in, in a way, a traditional way we think about it, and one in an untraditional way, which I'll mention in a minute. A traditional way is by and large places with more resources, had more resources to weather uh, these exceptional and trying circumstances than those that didn't. And the image to keep in your head is in working with about 65 high schools across the nation doing high school redesign, you know, we found, we heard two very different stories depending on place and circumstance. In some cases, the best the district and schools could do was essentially give kids instructional packets, essentially worksheets that they picked up every other week <laughs> um, on a Friday while they were getting food and were on their own to, to do them and then bring them in two weeks and maybe get some feedback and get the next packet. Juxtaposed against some schools which were able to essentially give kids multiple live video lessons every day that they watched both live with their classmates but also watched taped if they couldn't participate live and had scheduled daily 15 minutes one-on-one -on -one time with an adult or a small group of kids and adult. Um, that's two very different experiences, right? And, and led to very different amounts of sort of learning loss or challenge during COVID. The other one, um, and Peter is a great example of that, this is that schools that were more based on relationships and trust and sort of design principles were able to be more nimble. And those schools that were more based on sort of impersonal uh, structures and procedures often were quite brittle and like were not adaptive. And so really where a kid fell on that, on that access between resourced and under-resourced, nimble and non-nimble <laughs> really defines their experience in the spring. And as you can see, will lead to a very different needs in the, in the fall. The other piece of that puzzle is that well, everybody experienced COVID, and as this highlighted, they experienced it differently, both in their circumstances and their response to those circumstances. So we, as we know from the science of resilience and other things, two people can have the same experiences and interpret them differently, right? So that's got to be factored in to when kids are coming back. So we know, for example, in some of the most impacted cities, New York, Detroit, New Orleans, there will be students that lost multiple family members to COVID and will be in a deep sense of grief. In those same locations, there were some students, and I'm talking only about high school students now, who basically became frontline workers, got a job delivering food to support their family, and felt a great sense of agency from this. They felt like they were making a great contribution to themselves and to society. And they felt more validation from that than they normally experienced in school. So those kids are gonna be in a very different place coming back than those students struggling with grief, than those students struggling with multiple domains of the other issues we've brought up from food insecurity to worries about housing and all sorts of issues. So where that gets us is when our kids come back to us in the fall, we've gotta be very careful about not making things worse <laughs> and actually making them better. Um, and we could get this wrong, right? Especially if we fall back in sort of our old ways, which are sort of filled with implicit biases of, oh, you're a member of this demographic group. This, this demographic group really had COVID bad. So you must have big learning loss because you're part of this group. When we just said that same group had very different experiences. There's no way you can know ahead of time what the story is. You've got to talk to kids. You've got to survey kids. And as we say, you, you basically, before you test, you've got to reestablish relationships. You've got to reactivate their prior knowledge because it's almost a misnomer to say learning loss. It's not gone forever. It's just not been activated. And as we know from the science of learning, we just have to reactivate what's in our knowledge base to gain access to it. It's not like it's, it's vape in the vapor forever. Um, and also make kids understand the context for this testing, right? Because we know if they think you're, they're gonna be blamed or whatever, they will not do as well as if they just believe it's like a thing to help them. So we gotta put a lot of effort into this diagnostic testing to get it right, to get the right, the right data to make smart decisions. Um, and related to that is this idea that maybe the best defense is a good offense, right? It's, we're using these terms learning loss and like huge problems. And yes, that's true. And it's gonna differ by kids, but maybe the best thing we can do is just create a strong COVID resistance learning environment in the fall and fill in when we can and not assume that every kid needs remediation just because they were not in school for two months. Mm -hmm. A great example of this is actually we learned about Hurricane Katrina. Um, in New Orleans. A good number of the kids in New Orleans were actually out of school for a full year. Um, and 
when they came back, this again, this is high school level, which is the area that I know well. Um, the schools that went to a traditional remediation approach of like, we're going to, if you're in 10th grade, we're going to give you ninth grade because mm -hmm. you missed it. <laughs> um, didn't have a very good result. Um, the kids felt they were being babied down. They already learned this stuff that people were not appreciating where they were. And schools that instead sell, we're gonna teach you grade level and fill in on the spot as needed, right before each unit, figure out what we need, fill that in and move forward, did much better. So that's an example of perhaps the best defense is a good offense. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, um, you know, we have to be strategic and again, based on doing, you know, getting to know our kids first, where we can't get to know them, at least surveying them, um, is we have some powerful tools. Tutoring is a very effective way to close learning gaps. Okay. Um, we need to get that to the kids that's going to benefit, right? And not just, again, give it to a demographic group or a subset of kids, but who needs it should get it <laughs> to the amount they need it. Mm -hmm. um, this idea of school success coaching, which is really just a sort of mentoring on steroids, mm -hmm. right? It's about getting to know them as a person, but, but basically this idea of connecting to them two to three times a week in school, right? Not just a monthly check-in, but a much more rapid, you know, tempo. Um, because again, you know, kids' reactions, I mean, COVID's not gone, right? It's gonna, there's still gonna be, where kids are in September, in September is not where they're gonna be in October or in November. So you have to stay on top of that by having these relationships and be able to, you know, modulate your supports to the kids um, as they need them to try to get them right in the moment. And then finally, as Peter and both Yolanda spoke about, um, it's really important to form these partnerships, right? That no school is designed on a normal circumstances to give 25, 30, 40, 50, 70% of their kids mental health or physical health supports. Mm -hmm. But some schools are gonna have those numbers. And if we don't organize against them at a community level, right? A school alone can't just suddenly call someone up and say, please send me 10 psychologists and four social workers and <laughs> five outreach folks, right? That's gotta be a community effort to both provide that and to integrate that. So those are some of the key responses we've been learning and thinking about working with these high schools and sort of how to get it, get it right when the kids come back. Well, I, I wanna thank you. I think all three of you have given us quite a bit to, to think about. I mean, there's so many ways in which COVID has presented us with unprecedented challenges. So, I mean, I think we are all going to need to put our heads together and collaboration is really going to be key to helping us to solve some of these issues. I, I wanna open it up now to some of the questions that I have in listening to the three of you present. And I think, Peter, I wanna start with you and just thinking about, given your presentation in the population of children that you serve and your, your faculty serve at the Henderson Hopkins School, who do you see as the most vulnerable students coming out of the spring with the school closures due to COVID? Yeah, I mean, in some ways it accentuates our most, our biggest challenges, right? So like if I, if you went back to my graph where those, about that, that 15% that are not engaging regularly, weekly, like that, that's the group that we're worried about. And when we hear, when we reach out to them and hear about what are the, some of their challenges, um, it's many of the same ones that we had pro when we had school, right? Um, we have families that are homeless that are, that are, that are, that are moving around. Yeah. Um, we have our special needs students that need extra care and attention that yeah. need to, and we're, we're, we're connecting with them. But the question is, the, is it the right type of environment? Because it has to be more self-guided even. Um, so I'm, I'm worried about that. I mean, we have, we, mental health is a really big issue um, um, in our communities um, and not only depression, but things like, um, and, and so, <laughs> getting those students, making sure they don't fall off our radar. We were having issues getting them to school. Now mm -hmm. getting them engaged is a big challenge. Um, and so that gives you some idea. Now layer on everything, just lay, it's kind of like a layer. That's what we had those challenges to begin with, but now we have COVID where we have many of our, um, we, we have experienced loss within our community. So those students, if they didn't have any of those issues, now they have are presented with maybe losing a family member, um, and how are we helping them kind of um, 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 deal with that? Um, 
And then uh, of course the, the racial stress too of what's going on in our uprisings across the country. I mean, I mean, I, that's my, my student demographic and I know our teachers are working with them to help them. So to be honest, I think everyone's vulnerable, Dr. Anderson. Um, and, and, and we have to really think about this strategically in our school. Like we have to build in time. We can't just say, oh, this is social emotional learning time and do 20 minutes. It right. ha we have to think right. about a way to incorporate this work, the trauma-informed care. How do we help and support all of our students? How do we build it in? And then yeah. the students who need it most um, that exhibit, we, we're, we, we deploy a team to help them. So let me push back on that a little bit, Peter. How do we, how do we identify those students that are the most at risk? because we all know that we have limited resources in schools and even in a school that is as well resourced as Henderson Hopkins, we know that there are still places where you need additional support. So given the profile of the students that you've identified and knowing that there are still going back into the fall, that there are gonna be some students that we need to think about trying to triage supports for immediately. How will you, how do you and your team think about trying to deliver services and identify the students that you think need those supports the most? I mean, it's a great question. Prior to this, we had, a, we had identified already 85 to 100 students who had specialized needs that we are, are on caseloads, that we have a team of. So it's building a team of professionals that include mental health, that include a social worker, a guidance counselor. We have a partnership with the, the, the School of Education um, guidance um, that is giving us interns. It's really, so that's prior to COVID. That's, that's almost 20% of our population that we're designing individual needs from everything from grief to, to depression, to finding, connecting them to resources, um, but then also helping them with academic needs too, right? Um, so that, we, you have to have a team in place. And then secondly, you have to, um, you got to, you got to know your students. You have to be in touch with them. Absolutely. So we, we've deployed everybody on our leadership team, which is an extended team of 10 people that have a caseload that are checking into our most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And we were actually on Friday stopping by their houses and knocking on doors and seeing how they're doing and checking up on them. So it's like, it's a, it's, it's partnerships and relationships. Yeah. And, and as our guests are putting questions in the chat box, we will be monitoring. So we want to ask your questions too. So please feel free to start adding questions. Bob, you were going to re respond to yeah, Peter. I was going to just build on that a little bit. So uh, two points. One is that uh, many schools have multi-tiered student support systems or teams. And those can be adapted sort of to a COVID environment. I mean, that they already provide sort of a sense of tiering. You're trying, what are you doing whole school? What are you doing for small groups? What are you doing for individual? But we've we've talked with our schools and we've in other places we there's you can think about again doing some short surveys to understand which kids need stronger relationships, which kids need to build up some resiliency, which kids need some engagement, um, and use that to sort of feed your already existing tiered responses. So it's not just doing the same things as before, but it's using those systems and then gathering COVID specific information on your kids first through relationships, as Peter said, and then if you don't have them all with your kids, start building them. But in the meantime, you can survey your kids. Um, and what that got to is that recently the America's Promise Alliance did a yeah. nationally representative survey of 13 to 19 year olds. Mm -hmm. um, and that revealed, for example, that 25% were feeling disconnected from school adults and classmates, right? Yeah. This, this quarter of kids, really, they're just feeling like out, you know, no one is behind me in a sense, right? Which is really, really, uh, staggering and another 25 percent and some are the same um so they are losing more sleep they're more unhappy they're feeling under strain they're losing confidence in themselves so mm -hmm. those are bigger numbers than the number of kids that are currently on you know struggling to stay in school um mm -hmm. so that tells us that covid has increased that group of students um that are feeling this disconnect and feeling personal strain and i you know the best way is for people who know those kids to talk to them and then pool that information to make sure we have a story of every kid where that can't be done. Um, short surveys can, can give you a sense of where your school's needs are um, okay. and, and how to adapt to them. Yeah, that's a great idea. 
Uh, Yolanda, I want to ask you this question from Raphael Curtis. Is there a role that large districts can play in leveraging technical resources in a more centralized way without kind of putting any constraints on local control and innovation? Yes, both in terms of the guidance, direction, and the money that is given and suggestions on how schools within a district, especially those who are geographically um, connected or in the same general area, might do some of their work together. So it isn't each school operating independently, but it's schools within a catchment area who are coming together to collaborate and to connect around services offered and opportunities um, for children and their families. Mm -hmm. Making that connection to community and or faith-based organizations that ideally some schools already have because schools, as you've already said, do have limited resources in terms of all that they can do. So how do you build those partnerships, especially for families that might already have a connection to a faith-based institution, that there's something going on there, that the institutions um, have some general working knowledge of the school and kind of how it operates. Not that they're replacing it, but just in terms of understanding the opportunity and the commitment. So I really think it comes down to the leveraging of resources and kind of the technical skills and support that helps schools work with each other as opposed to sometimes against each other or within silos. Thank you. And, and here's a question for all of you. Given the mentioned need for large numbers of counselors and psychologists and other support professions in schools for our students. Should schools be looking to train and recruit a large number of volunteers to go into the schools as mentors this fall or to support them virtually? Peter, do you feel like you um, Yeah, I mean, some of this, I mean, it's, so everything, you know, I'd say a couple things. Yeah, if they're trained professionals and volunteers that could come in and support the work, it, it would have to be, we'd have to figure that out, right? But to me, like what we've realized, and, and I see Mr. Velleman, who's our head, lead guidance counselor, who's on this call listening, he's done a masterful job of building connections with organizations that this is like real professional work. I mean, like grief of a, like, like a mourning, loss, mental health, um, um, uh, you know, di different issues need different professionals to help support. Um, although, and I want to just, so, so I would just like to say having people that can connect to resources that helps uh, build the, the school's bandwidth is important. I also want to um, kind of validate something that Bob said, like the idea that like, like a small group tutoring and getting professional, like people who, who can really work with kids and working with kids individually, we've been having to do that. We're launched, we can really like think about that strategically. So I, you know, we need professionals and we need to build the bench for professionals and you can do that through partnerships or building your own team. But the idea of volunteers coming in, you know, really accessing people in scripted like ways to kind of help with small group tutoring or one-on-one -on -one tutoring can really be beneficial. And so let me just follow that up. I know Bob is going to have something to add to that, but I also have a question here about school nurses. I see a question here from Beverly Woods, and I know that most schools, we know most schools do not have a full-time school nurse in the building. So what are we supposed to do as we think about, you know, the expanded role of school nurses to support our most vulnerable students as well? That's critical. We've got to deal with this question around the shortage of health professionals in the building. Um, are, do you, any of the three of you have any ideas about how we might try to do that and what you think school nurses should be focused on? Well, I mean, so school nurses are a very powerful resource um, for keeping kids connected um, and problem solving, right? They, they, they help both those things. They can help just form those relationships um, and also help help solve problems right when you when you don't have that sometimes relatively minor health issues can keep kids out of school in total because there's no capacity to do the small things that help keep them in school mm -hmm. so most chronic conditions kids can attend school if they have the proper supports in many cases kids with chronic conditions and poor neighborhoods don't attend school because there is no supports and if they do they get sent 
essentially they call 911 and they take them to an emergency room, right? So that's crazy. <laughs> but this, this is actually an area where we need policy solutions, right? It's not just about schools being more inventive or doing more with less. It's about, it is sort of crazy that every school doesn't have a nurse. And we essentially have to really win a policy battle on that. Um, as people think about COVID additional spending, that's an important domain to put it in, but not as a one-time, one-year bandage, but as a more systematic change. And it also, it stretch, I'm sorry, Peter, you go ahead. I was just going to say it stress, stresses the role of the school leader. Who, if you look at Peter, who's a model of what school leaders are supposed to be able to do, but now you also add in the health piece. We're expecting so much from one person that it becomes really difficult for school leaders to do all those things. Peter? Um, I just want to add, it was back to the LEA question mm -hmm. that like, what could large LEAs or just more like a sector could do? Sure. But like, and it's a, it goes to equity, equity. Like every child needs a device, full end stop. They're $200 a piece. Come on, we can do that. Absolutely. But number two, like, let's talk about reliable. This is what I've learned, reliable internet for every child in Baltimore in the country. So what does that mean? Everybody was excited because Comcast Essentials, I'm going to break this down. Comcast Essentials came and offered three months of free internet, okay? It took my students three weeks of waiting, my family's three weeks of waiting to get on the list of free, the free internet Comcast Essentials. So it wasn't the worst thing in the world, but three weeks. I mean, that I, they kept calling Mr. Canham, I'm on the wait list. We had to work that through. Number two, it turns out if someone didn't pay their bill in Comcast, they were a former customer. Oh, but they were now trying to get Comcast Essentials and they, there was some issue with the bill, they would get restricted and bumped out. Now, no one knew that. And, and that impacted some of my family. Um, now, that's not the, I mean, Comcast did a, a wonderful thing for three months, but th th those families didn't have reliable internet access. The third thing was then everybody opened up hotspots and they said, oh, hotspots. Well, imagine you walking around with a laptop and what am I, what was I supposed to, I was coaching a mother and told her you have to, tell the kid to go out to the park where they could access the hotspot and they have to do remote learning outside. Like, so it's just another it example. So yes, yeah, but, but it's just another example of, oh, we've got internet for everybody. No, no, we really don't. And this is kind of like a non-negotiable that we should have. Like, come on. Then that's not just the school system. It's the school system working with providers, working with the city, and we should just make it a thing. We should have broadband and let's make it happen. Like their communities, like, in, in West Baltimore that are starting to figure that out. Um, we should do that. It should just, um, that's an equity issue that should be a non-negotiable. Yes, the policy leader, Bob. I was gonna echo, yeah, broadband should be a public good. Like I agree and, and stop. <laughs> totally, totally. We've got a great question from Carol Harms asking, how can I, as a classroom teacher, work to build those relationships in the fall when we are likely to have very limited in-person contacts and access with our students? What should classroom teachers be thinking about? This is to me, and I'll, and I'll just, this is where like the, the teachers are the artists, yes. right? Like they are, they, there's ways to do it. They're like, you, you can even, I've seen it, masterful jobs done on Zoom calls where you actually take time, connection before content. You get to know your kids. You get to love them. You get to care for them. You could go around and drop off, like have like little incentives and drop off like goodie bags to kids in the mailboxes. We've done that or drop things off at their stoop. You know, get to know your kids in a way that they know. If, 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 you, if our kids know that we care about them, we love them, they'll work for us. And so it's like, that's what, I mean, so there's a lot of different ways that you can do that, even in a, in a, remote, in a remote world. And one of the simplest ways is that I agree with what Peter said is, is it's by far the preferred way, but a simple way is that this point that it's actually a rare moment in time, almost everybody has a shared common experience, which we all experience COVID. It dislocated all of us. So if teachers just begin beginning as a person, how COVID affected me and tell their story and the kids tell their stories, right? Then you're building a relationship around a common experience, which is how, we, how that begins. And usually we don't we don't have common experiences, so it's harder. So there's actually a, we can build upon what we have to sort of tell our stories, and that that connects us, and then build from there. Great. And I am not disregarding some of the equity issues in terms of access to devices or 
internet that is reliable and stable and um, fast enough that multiple people can be on it simultaneously, because that can be an issue yeah. as well. Sure. Um, so as a teacher, I don't know what your summer will be like, but how are you also looking at some of the social media that might be out there? Mm -hmm. As a faculty instructor utilizing Flipgrid, which allows for small videos that both myself and my students shared a little bit about who we are and some comments in relation to the content of the course that I'm teaching. It allows you to kind of see a person. Now, obviously there's some age things associated with that. Our youngest learners are probably not doing that. Some of our more neuro um, diverse students, depending on what their diagnosis might be, might not be able to do that. But I think there are some tools out and available that can also help to kind of foster that type of space so that we can still get to know each other and not feel disconnected. Great. So I have a question from Jessica Azevedo. And her question is, what suggestions do you have for children who have either special needs or a medical diagnosis? And Jessica, just a note to you that this is the first of our series and we have several other uh, conversations planned and our one of our uh, later conversations will deal specifically with the topic of special needs in the age of COVID. But for today's conversation, I want to throw this out back to, let's see, let's start with you, Yolanda. What do you think we should be doing for our children with special needs or children who have a medical diagnosis? I want to start my answer by saying this is not my area of expertise or research. <laughs> so again, it really will depend on kind of what that diagnosis is. But if you think about UD, um, UDL, um, and I so just blanked on what UD, UDL actually stands for. Universal Design. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking to I, I am human, <laughs> yes. So thinking about kind of the accessibility issues, the colors, the contrast, of whatever platform that we are utilizing, whether or not we are utilizing things that can be audio inscribed as well in terms of their listing, um, whether or not there is a speech to text, if the person can talk and um, have their answers come out that way. So again, I think there are some technological things that exist depending on what a learner's diagnosis is and what needs to be supported. I think we still kind of come back to that issue of whether or not they are in the household. And if not, how do we help them get in the household so students can have the most robust learning experience possible? And Bob, thank you, Yolanda. Bob, can you tell me a little bit about, for the students that you work with at the Everyone Graduate Center, those students are at risk, at high risk of uh, dropping out. And we yeah. want to move them into the column of being at promise. Yeah. So yeah. what do we need to be thinking about for those for those students? Yeah. Well, it's actually there's actually uh, some very rich uh, school connectedness literature um, that actually comes out of public health. Um, and it, 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 it gives you some very simple things that make big differences. So we know when kids have two, not just one, two adults who know them as a person mm -hmm. and they would say care about me as a person. That really matters and keeps you connected to school. When you have a peer group, it helps, um, it, it connects with your identity, whatever that may be. You feel like there's other people to be with. <laughs> um, if you are involved in a pro-social activity, and this is the one that sort of surprises people sometimes, yeah. you feel much more giving to others. Because we often think like teenagers are so self-absorbed. It's about them, they're in their own world. They're, it's all about their peers. It turns out they very much want to be pro-social and give to others. And COVID is, needs lots of people helping lots of people. So it's a really important, important thing to tap. And then finally, they feel school is a welcoming environment. Mm -hmm. If you have those four things, if you think there's adults that care about me, kids I can be with, something purposeful I can do, and I don't feel that school is hostile, you'll stay in school. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, you won't. Are there new groups of students that are particularly concerning for you? So Peter, as you talked about the, the, the siblings that were, uh, that were a connected family and um, obviously, you know, they, they had a unique challenge that we're finding out is not so unique for many families. Um, are, are there new groups of students that concern you um, going back to school in the fall that you were not previously worried about and then well, Bob and Yolanda, you can join in as well to this. I mean, the, the biggest one is people are experiencing loss. 
due to COVID. Like the dealing, like we already have a partnership to deals with loss because we we have to deal with deal with that spe specifically because we um, um, just had to had to deal with that in the past. Um, but then also we're also you know people experiencing racial stress. I mean, like, again, that like those two group of students that, again, that could have been on, under the surface, but it's really gonna maybe, we're trying to prepare for there could be, a, that, that could be another set of needs of students that we have to work with. Absolutely. Yolanda, are there, are there concerns that you have that you just going into COVID and then Bob? I think you? on some levels, we have done a good job of talking about students. I just want to, on some level, bring us back to teachers, which I do know is next week's focus, but there are people too experiencing these same stresses. Oh, and so kind of how do we balance that out so that we can do and be all of these things for our students and who they are and who we want them to be. So I think that's really key. I also want to reiterate what Bob said in terms about those relationships. So my um, research on fathers, one of the key points that surprised me at the time when I found it out, whether or not they were subsequently involved in their own children's lives once mm -hmm. they became fathers mm -hmm. could be linked back to whether or not they thought they had teachers that cared when they went to school themselves. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, again, that social emotional piece and how we are really helping people to process all that's going on in the world and make those connections in ways that they see the support to see them through to whatever it is they need to finish or achieve in relation to the academic school experience. What I, what I would add to connect the, the teachers and the kids is that because the COVID has been so broad in its impacts and essentially affected most, right, if not all kids, um, teachers, whether they want to or not, or believe they should or not, are, are able to, are essentially the frontline providers. Like they are the point, the first point of contact for kids for all kinds of needs. So A, that says we have to make sure we can give them whatever professional supports or training as possible in these trauma-informed care and, um, you know, uh, a, a host of things, right? <laughs> Not overwhelming them because they're overwhelmed, but where make it available for those when and where they can access it, just like we have to for our students. Um, make it flexible how they can access it. Mm -hmm. And then also recognize they're going to need supports. They're going to need their own mental health supports and their own mindset breaks in their own because they're being asked to do a lot of you know when working with our high school teachers you know many of them are working crazy hours right it's not yeah. like they get going early in the morning and they're still talking to kids at midnight because like well that's why my high school kids are up like my high school kids aren't up at 11 in the morning when they're home they're up at midnight mm -hmm. and so you know they're working longer hours not not less hours um and we have to you know there's some concern that you can do that on adrenaline for a couple of months but Ultimately, you can't sustain it. So we have to have concerns about what kind of supports we give it to teachers in the fall yeah. um, as well. And, and just to, to put a point on that, Bob, so what do you see as the, the lifetime, the cumulative effect of these vulnerabilities manifesting for our students most at promise? What do you see? Because we know that learning loss affects a, a student, but it also affects their community, affects their family. How do we see that manifesting over the life course for a student? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest concern in our work is that, that, that this left unattended, or if we get, get the response wrong, mm -hmm. um, or we don't make those big policy shifts we need to make to support good response, is we're going to end up with just more out of school, out of work youth. Oh. Um, and once you become 16, 17, 18 years old without a high school degree and no steady work, it is very hard to recover from that position. And that not only impacts you, it impacts your family, it impacts your community. And we know because of structural inequities and racial discrimination and all the bad housing policies we've had, right? We've concentrated us our highest need kids in a subset of neighborhoods and a subset of schools, which will then have high rates of out of school, out of work youth, which will further strain everything. So that's that's the most dire scenario. Now, the, the thing is, we know that's coming. I always say it's like insider trading for the social good. Like we know today what's gonna happen tomorrow unless we do something about it. So we're in a position, it's not gonna be easy, but if we see it coming, we can try and get in front of it. <laughs> Wow. Just to put a fine point on that is um, just what we've learned from our food distribution 
um, where you have uh, hours before we open up our lines, like people lined up, ready to come in cars, in lined up waiting. Oh, yeah. And the need is so dire, right? And so we really haven't unpacked the, like, so that that's just like, we're giving out 10,000 pounds of food at least, and it's gone within an hour. Um, and, and, and so that's serving 300 families and it's mostly community. So it's like what, just to put a fine, like, it's like, but I, we haven't really unpacked the amount of people who've lost their jobs, the impact on family, the impact on housing, are they going to have to move? Um, and how are they going to pay the bills? And then who's last in line to get jobs, um, you know, are going to be our uneducated youth. So it's like, it's, it's something that we haven't really, really talked about enough, but like we have to be really um, worried about. Yolanda. I concur wholeheartedly and not just the ones who might be pushed out or leave school for whatever reason, but even those who might graduate but don't have the types of skills needed for the jobs of today and the jobs of tomorrow that to some extent we don't even know what they are. So kind of how do we help to make sure that we have the critical thinking and problem solving skills and not just so that we can go out and have jobs, but so we can also be the entrepreneurs and the creators of jobs as well. If you want to start talking about equity, it isn't always just about being the worker, but being the creator and the person who's helping to um, bring that economic growth and development, both in the context of the community in which you might live and ideally your family structure as well. So there are a variety of things to be concerned about as we are moving forward and looking at this through a long-term lens. And while finance was not necessarily the topic of this conversation, how do we have those types of conversations when people may be struggling with that very day-to-day, -day, how do I keep this roof over my head, food on my table, my lights on, so on and so forth, in ways that tend to build some kind of economic wealth, if you will, and cushion in terms of this. Because while COVID did um, impact everyone, to some extent, those who have a uh, larger resource space could minimize the impact in ways that those of us who didn't have those have had a harder time doing. So I want to thank you. I think, you know, you have, the three of you have given us a lot of insight and, and we're going to walk away from this conversation with a lot to think about because there still are so many unanswered questions. We know that equity is an ethical question. It's an ethical concern and we need to put our resources towards helping our most at promise students first. And that has to be our priority. So I just wanna say thank you. We weren't able, there were so many good questions in the chat. I wasn't able to get to all of them, but I wanna thank our audience for sharing those questions. We tried to get to as many of them as we possibly could. Um, that you, We really appreciate your participation today. This is a great dialogue and we will have five more of these webinars coming up. I want to thank our panelists, our esteemed panelists this afternoon, Peter Conham, Dr. Yolanda Abel, and Dr. Bob Belfance. I want to thank you for joining us and for sharing your wisdom. I also want to thank our sponsors from the Johns Hopkins University School of Education, the Hopkins Consortium for, for School-Based Health Solutions, the Berman Institute of Bioethics, and the Rails Center for the Integration of Health and Education. I, I want to thank our audience Thank you for joining us today, taking the time out of your schedule. This is a recorded um, session, and so you will be able to find it uh, on our website as well. And again, I just want to say thank you so very much to everyone. This is a topic of conversation that I know we will need to revisit very soon as we prepare to go back to school in the fall. Next, Join us next Monday at 3 o'clock when we take on the next conversation. Should I stay or should I go? <laughs> <laughs> Important. Teacher choice and school reopenings. And we will have with us next week, again, some esteemed colleagues from the School of Education, Dr. Mary Ellen Beatty O'Farrell, the department chair in the Department of Innovate, Innovative Teaching and Learning in the School of Education, and Dr. Eric Rice, who is also department chair and the director of the Urban Teachers Program, and then Dr. Tara Kirksell from the Center for Health Security at Johns Hopkins will be our panelists for next week. So I just want to 
say thank you all so much for joining us and we look forward to your continued engagement as this series proceeds. I am your moderator. I'm honored to have been able to moderate this important conversation. Annette Anderson, thank you so much for joining us today. Have a good day. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.